The pleas to take Trump seriously as he ratchets up and up and up and up and up the rhetoric are coming from far and wide today. From that statement we read you from the Biden campaign to prosecutors in New York as they prepare to put Trump on trial in his first criminal trial two weeks from right now. The ex-president has continued his attacks on the daughter of Judge Juan Mershon. That's even as the Manhattan District Attorney has called for Trump to, quote, immediately desist. This time sharing a news story with photos of the judge's daughter. Daily Beast reports this, quote, ranting on True Social on Saturday evening. Former president shared a link to a New York Post article about Lauren Mershon, who leads a political consulting firm that works with Democrats. In his post, Trump once again claimed without evidence that Lauren's political work was proof of her father, Judge Juan Mershon, being compromised and saying he should be removed from his case. Our democracy grappling in real time with Donald Trump's, Trump's dangerous, inflammatory and escalating rhetoric is where we begin again today with some of our most favorite experts and friends. Former senator and co-host of MSNBC's How to Win 2024 podcast, Claire McCaskill's here. Plus, former lead investigator for the January 6th Select Committee, Tim Hafey, is back. And former top official at the Department of Justice and MSNBC legal analyst, Andrew Weissman, is back with us. Tim Hafey, I want to start with you. Was the committee able to establish... Um, um, or just detail the ways in which the committee was able to establish a tie between Trump's language and violent acts. Absolutely, Nicole. There is a call and response that goes back and forth between the former president's rhetoric, rhetoric and real life consequence on the ground. It goes back a long time, but we talked to a lot of Proud Boys who interpreted that stand by and stand back comment at the debate as a reason for them to, to join the organization and uh, organize on January 6th, when he talked about specific election workers, individuals, they got death threats. They had people outside of their house. So there's no question that the committee's work established that this is not simply rhetorical. This is not simply anecdotal, hypothetical uh, political rhetoric. It, when he talks about violence, even if he intends it rhetorically, it is taken seriously by his followers, and that has real consequences. And let's, again, let's put this back into the words of his own followers. Let me show you some of this. And we land on Stephen. <clears throat> We're going to work on this, but we have some of that evidence that you um, developed. L let me ask you, Andrew Weissman, to put this moment into some context of your career. Um, we'll give it that arc. Um, it, it seems to me, and, and I concluded on Friday, that at some point it stops being about Trump, right? Um, even mob defendants have a desire not to be in prison while they're awaiting trial, and their shenanigans seem to have some responsiveness to that desire not to be in prison. Trump's behavior seems totally immune and almost outside of all of the levers and tools available in a criminal justice system. So, so put what you're seeing in real time from this criminal defendant in, in, in relation or, or in context to what else you've seen in your career. You know, when I look at this, it, it's not a reflection of Donald Trump. I mean, we know what he is. He has engaged in this behavior. It is it, it will increasingly be over the top as he is gets closer and closer and then is on criminal trial. This is about our institutions and how they um, are incapable of actually handling this situation for a whole variety of reasons. In, in normal cases, when I've handled uh, organized crime cases, violent criminals, there is a process where they are um, held to standards. And if they were to engage in this kind of conduct, yes, they are usually given sort of the one bite at the apple. They're given one warning. And then there are consequences, which can include and, and often does include jail. Just think about not that long ago, Paul Manafort, he committed um, obstruction of justice by coaching two witnesses to lie, and he was remanded by the federal judge who oversaw his case. So I really think this is a situation where you have so many people bending over backwards, giving the former president the benefit of the doubt over and over again. And I think that is sort of the road to hell. 
um, by not having um, sort of held these trials already, by not having investigated in a timely way, by not holding him to the exact same standard that we told anyone else to, we're both violating our oaths of office. We're violating what it means to have a justice system that holds everyone to the same standard. And it really, I know it, it, a lot of times it's born out of trying to be ultra fair, but it's leading to really a, like beyond two systems of justice, it's a unique system of justice for Donald Trump, which is not constant with what it means to have a democracy. And we may find ourselves without a democracy if we don't sort of wise up and hold him to the same standard that we do. Everyone else who has ever been treated that way in all of the criminal cases I've ever done in my entire life. I mean, this is the mo farthest I've heard you go, Andrew Weissman. And I mean, you're describing ultra fair. And, and, I, and I appreciate that you went farther than to say a singular standard. He, he now exists in a status only available to him, wasn't available to Jeffrey Epstein, wasn't available to, to mob bo I mean, it, it, it exists only for him. And I wonder if at some point we stop with all of this. We say he was too much for the judicial system. I have some breaking news on that front. I'll bring it to you in a second. But I, but I wonder if this, if the, if it's a charade at this point, Andrew Weissman, if we should just have a conversation with the voters, say, listen, it is always up to you who you want to represent you every four years. But now more than ever, you are voters, you are jurors. Here's all the facts as I see them. Is that where we are? Well, I, I do think that we are at a situation where you do have to ask yourself at a time when you see a federal judge, a sitting federal judge having to go on air to defend the rule of law, um, but you don't see that by um, members of Congress uh, can Damning violence. Uh, you don't see that from the Department of Justice understanding the situation we're in, speaking out in the way, for instance, Archibald Cox had spoken out. And, you know, you have three uh, former prosecutors here with Claire and Tim and my experience. And I, if you'd ask any of us, if we ever had a defendant like this and their name was not Donald Trump, would any of us say that the judge wouldn't have hauled that person in and read them, at the very least, read them the riot act about what they can and cannot do? That would have happened the moment of the of the post being made with respect to the current president. Remember, this has nothing to do with a gag order. It is simply a crime to threaten um, the president of the United States. But it's also something that can lead to having a much, much stricter gag order. All of that would have happened by now. And it's the idea that he can say that he's being treated unfairly is is so laughable because I think anybody on this panel would say he's been treated with kid gloves by the system. Well, and it's, again, I, I often say we need a, a psychologist or sociologist here. All of the, you know, you, you use the word ultra fairness, all of the efforts from, from Mueller to Garland, every, everywhere that he encountered the criminal justice system, it did what you just described. It sought to overcompensate for what he constantly projected onto those processes. And here we are. And where we are is with an update to the story we came on the air with at this hour Friday. And that is what is now a legal process around a gag order. Uh, there's breaking news on that front. The Manhattan DA's office has just issued a new filing delineating a lot of the weekend's attacks. Lisa Rubin, what do you, what's in here? Really, really strong language, Nicole. And I think a sort of concession from the DA's office about something you and I had discussed before, which is that the gag order as it presently exists maybe doesn't cover family members of the court or of the DA's office. But if it doesn't, they are saying now is the time to expand it and also, as they asked Friday, to warn Donald Trump that one more violation and the consequences will include criminal contempt under New York law. Now, the criminal contempt statutes that they cite here allow for the imprisonment of a person who violates willfully a court order by up to 30 days. So we have had many conversations about is the law sufficient in a situation like this? You have the DA's office saying it is if you only have the will to impose it. What does that mean? 
I mean, they're basically saying to Michonne, the choice is yours, right? This is a major collective action problem in some respects nationwide because every judge who has had this man before them has dealt with a situation not unlike this. Tanya Chutkin has, Arthur N. Goron, who had the civil fraud case, right. has, Lou Kaplan, who presided over both E. Jean Carroll trials right. that I watched, has. And they are saying, we have seen this happened. We've seen this movie before, right? And we don't need to supplement this with that history because everything that he's done, and I'm quoting now from this filing mm -hmm. by them, everything that he's done since your honor's March 26th order alone in and of itself justifies expanding the order. They call his speech disruptive and terrifying. They note that he referred to Michael Cohen as death last week, mm -hmm. and then they say that what he has done with respect to Judge Marchand's daughter is simply off limits, but even more unjustifiable because it is based on falsehoods. It is based on falsehoods about her social media accounts, and they describe how that is an impersonation of an account that she once held. They also say that it's a falsehood based on what kind of income she's garnering from the profession that she has now. But even if it were true, they say, it doesn't justify these attacks. So even if, for example, Judge Mershon should have recused himself or that it was arguable that he could have recused himself, they remind him you asked a judicial advisory panel last year when the Trump folks first came before you and said, this case mm -hmm. should not be before you. You asked them, what should I do? They told you you should hold on to the case, and therefore his attacks on your daughter are especially problematic and flagrant right now. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC. NBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the app store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.